Uh, man, we just had Sheila and Keith Gregoire on the podcast. We've already had Sheila once. This time we got Keith with her and we dove into all of their books, but specifically The Good Guys Guide to Great Sex. Not just sex, great, great sex. sex. Really good conversation. It really, really was. Um, I've had so much respect for Sheila since she you know, did her 20,000 person study that launched the great sex rescue book, which my wife and I both read and just was so phenomenal. But, um, to now see the work that they've done with the good girls guide and the good guys guide to great sex. Um, this is a resource that is, I think bringing the church back to a true foundation of intimacy, sex, God's design and, and ditching a lot of the old stigmas, the old shame, you know, the things that leadership has brought into the conversation that is just has nothing to do with reality or Jesus or, you know, God. Yeah. Yeah. It's rethinking sex is what it is. It It feels like it's rethinking sex. And you even use the language as deconstructing and reconstructing. Mm -hmm. What I love about what they're running at is that, first of all, they're solutions based and they're facts based. I mean, they went and did the research. They weren't thinking through uh, that research based off of a particular theological bent. They really were interested in finding uh, solutions, finding answers to questions and, and, and really looking for solutions. And I think what they're doing and what we've t- we talked about a great deal in, in this conversation is removing any obligation, any transaction, any hierarchy mm-hmm. in, in any way, shape or form about what we think about God and, and how that relates uh, within the bedroom. And so it was, a, I mean, it was a really good conversation, uh, practical at times, uh, at times uh, getting into the nature of how we've perceived God and how that's impacted our marriages and particularly intimacy. Um, and they're a lot of fun, a lot of fun to talk to. Yeah. I mean, you know, Sheila and Keith, they don't, they don't pull any punches. They just lay it all out there. And, uh, it makes for an, a, a very intriguing conversation that I think is going to really help a lot of people. It will. And I am looking up just real quick, her, uh, website. So I can say that you can find her at the transformed wife.com and Bear Marriage, B-A-R-E, marriage.com is another way to get a hold of all her courses, her books, listen to her podcast, which is also called Bear Marriage. And uh, from there, you can get a hold of all her socials as well. Um, And it was nice to meet her husband. Yeah. Like, what a great guy. Yeah. And deep, deep and, and very open. Yeah relational. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I wouldn't expect anything less from a bunch of Canadians. <laughs> I was completely outnumbered here. Um, but as you know, I count myself as an honorary Canadian. And we, uh, and we count you as one as well. Yeah, there were a few Zeds thrown about and a few abouts thrown about. <laughs> oh, well, uh, you know. Uh, you know, it's all good. Um, <laughs> yeah, good conversation. I think it's uh, going to be encouraging and highly recommend the book, The Good Guy's guide to great sex also the good girls guide to great sex these two books just on the front end here i would say i would recommend every single pastor that does premarital counseling should hand a copy of these books to the couple that they are doing the ceremony for and we we have we have a strategy now with sheila and keith and that is if we could get this message out to as many people as possible in this next generation in 10 years we could see a complete transformation of the uh sexual way that God intended. Yeah. In our marriages. Amen. Yeah. Guys, um, as always share, like, uh, write a review. Those things are helpful. Uh, you can find, uh, us at a family story.org. Uh, if you're looking for the podcast or anywhere podcasts are available and, uh, we're listener supported. Uh, you can give it a family story.org as well. If you'd like, that'd be a blessing. Yeah. Hey, without further ado, uh, Keith and Sheila Gregoire. Is it Gregoire? Am I saying that right? Gregoire. Keith and Sheila Gregoire. <laughs> me, Gregoire. Me, I don't know. I guess you can pronounce it either way. Uh, Keith and Sheila Gregoire. We should have asked him. Yeah. <laughs>
we're really honored to have you guys on again and meet you keith and and the second time around with you sheila this is yeah yeah uh, our last podcast really encouraged folks and uh, we're looking forward to diving into the good guys guide mm -hmm. and and all, wherever else this takes us uh go ahead derek man I'll yeah you... yeah jason i think i think we should start with just refreshing people's memory about sheila and the great sex rescue book and the uh, elaborate study that she did that provided some data to um, really change all of our mindsets and help us all rethink, uh, you know, what we'd been taught, not just about sex, but about specifically the relationship with the church and things that we'd been taught, purity culture, shame that went along with things. Um, Sheila really helped dismantle that with her study. Sheila, would you give a little background on that study? Because it was a really amazing study that you did. Sure. Well, what had happened was for about 12 years, I had been writing in the Christian marriage and sex space. I had written some books. I did a big blog. And then one day I sat down and I actually read some of the other evangelical bestsellers. Um, I hadn't read them up till then because I was so afraid of plagiarizing. And when I did, I realized, <laughs> oh my gosh, there's a lot of really unhealthy stuff here. I, I started with love and respect and I read things like if your husband is typical, he has a need that you don't have. Right. And the need is for physical release. There wasn't a single word about intimacy, right. not a single word about how women should feel pleasure too. And it was just that you're not allowed to deprive him and you can never say no. And I thought this cannot be what we're teaching. Right. But as I looked at more and more books, I realized that was the message and no wonder so many marriages struggle. And so I thought, you know, I don't want this just to be my opinion, because part of the problem in the evangelical world is that people have written books where it's just their opinion. They're not basing it on anything else. So I, I got together with my team. I had a, a woman, um, Joanna Swatsky, one of my co-authors, who is an epidemiologist and a statistician. Um, my daughter, Rebecca Lindenbach, is a psychometrics. Um, uh, she loves psychometrics, did that in her undergrad, psychology grad. And so she created our survey. Joanna analyzed our survey. And we, t we looked um, at 20,000 <laughs> evangelical women. And we asked them so many questions about their marital and sexual satisfaction and how that correlated with different toxic beliefs that are often um, shared in the church. And we just identified a lot of messages that really do harm. I was going to say, I just want to add, Sheila never, uh, Sheila sometimes doesn't um, make it clear how amazing the study really was. <laughs> I, no, I recognize that. Yeah. yeah. She didn't just That's say, why I wanted to start with it, because I don't think people realize the gravity of a 20,000 person survey yeah. to the level of questions and um, d the deep dive that you did. Uh, well, first of all, I want everybody to go and buy The Great Sex Rescue um, my wife and I have really, really loved it as pastors. It has been, a, it has reshaped the way we communicate sex to, um, our, our family there at, at river church. And so, um, I want to thank you for doing that and, and recognize the gravity of the work that you've done. I also, but now I'm realizing, I'm just realizing something. I'm realizing that you had a relatively healthy view of sex and intimacy within a marriage, when you began reading these other books like Love and Respect, I think uh, uh, Ed Gunger was another one that the, you know, woman's brain, man yeah, brain. Mark Gunger. Basically just Mark, Gunger. Yeah. Mark Gunger. Sorry. It was just a swipe from basically men are from Mars, women are from Venus and, you know, Christianized. Um, but uh, you began to correct a lot of that thinking. I want, I want you to tell us what we should be rethinking about sex, intimacy, from a perspective of a follower of Jesus. Okay, I may have asked you this. All the podcasts kind of blend in. So I don't know if I did this on the last podcast, but even if I did, I'm going to do it again, okay? <laughs> if I were to ask you, did you have sex last night? You think I'm asking, well, first of all, that's super creepy and I wouldn't do that, but, but, but I was just about to answer, so I'm glad I held back. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, you're thinking I'm saying something about penis and vagina move around till he climaxes. Like our definition of sex is intercourse. Right. Right. The problem with that is that she could be lying there making a grocery list in her head 
She could be in emotional turmoil or she could even be in physical pain and it would still count as having sex. Right. Mm. And if we think that sex is a gift from God and that God wants to make sure that sex is a vital part of your marriage and we also define sex as one-sided intercourse, we've got a real problem with what we think God wants for marriage. And when we go back to scripture, that is not the biblical definition of sex. Hmm. You know, I like to say there's a, there's a threefold. It goes more than that, but we're, we're going to summarize it with just three simple pictures and three simple words. Genesis 4 verse 1, Adam knew his wife Eve and they conceived a son. Yeah. Super funny way of putting it. But the Hebrew root for the word to know is the same root there as it is in the Psalms when David says, search me and know me, O God. Love so sex is this deep intimacy, this deep longing to be connected. We know sex is also pleasurable for both because Song of Solomon, she says more words than he does. She's having a good time. <laughs> and then in 1 Corinthians 7, we see a picture of sex, which is totally mutual. Everything that he gets, she gets and vice versa. And so mm -hmm. biblically, sex is something which is mutual, intimate and pleasurable for both. It isn't one sided intercourse. But in the church, we have made sex into a male entitlement and a female obligation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's really hurt us. Yeah. I, I, I spent the morning uh, because I knew we were talking. I'd, I'd already read some of your other stuff, Sheila, but I hadn't, I hadn't read The Good Guy's Guide. And that um, had been sent to us. So I was reading it this morning and I, I ran downstairs. I kept telling my wife, <laughs> they got the same story as us, as we've been married 28 years. And all we had was the book, um, was it The Act of Marriage or the... Yes, that's what, that's what wrecked me. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> that, that was all we had. And I thought, oh, I wish we'd had this. But we knew, we knew about intimacy. We were raised in loving homes and we understood how intimacy works. And I remember one of the most profound things my wife said, and she wasn't talking about the, 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 the bedroom, but she was, was before we got married, about a month before we got married, she said, oh, just so you know, uh, just so she was informing me, just so you know, I'm not going, I took obey out of my vows. And I, I was 21 when we got married and a guy. So a couple things going on. I hadn't really obsessed over vows anyway, but, and I was a guy, so I'd never caught it. I always thought obey was in both vows. I assumed the, the guy said it and the girl said it. And so I asked her, I was like, why, why would you take it out? And she was like, cause I'm not going to obey you. Like that's, we're not. And I was like, well, am I going to say it? She's like, it's not in the guy's vows. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, well, of course then. Yeah. And, and we intrinsically understood we weren't building our relationship on obligation, on obedience. This wasn't a transactional thing. We were wanting intimacy and we understood that obedience in the, in the context of marriage is, is a very broken thing. Even then, and I don't know how many times as a pastor I sat with, with fellows who would come in and they have marriage problems and, and the fellows talking, the wife sitting there and the fellows talking about the one scripture he knows how to, how, you know, wives submit to your husbands. You know, mm -hmm. he doesn't know too much scripture, but he seems to know that one. <laughs> and I want to cuff him on the back of the head and say, man, you need to read a little bit earlier because if husbands love their wives as Christ loves the church, uh, laying his life down, then we're not talking about obedience in the mm -hmm. context of control and transaction. We're talking about mutual self-giving uh, love that is a place where trust can grow I would, I would love for you to speak to, because I think what we've run up against is, uh, and there's a, there's a quote, I'm going to read it to you from the book. Uh, we can't get to great sex using a route that steals honor and dignity from women while ascribing horrible motives to men. And uh, I, I, would, I would like to know where that shame, where that obedience, where that came from, because you clearly were healthy. Uh, Ten years into your marriage, you guys had figured some things out. Uh, I've read enough to know we're very, very similar. And I would love, uh, you knew when you read the stuff that wasn't right, this isn't right. How did you know? It wasn't just scripture at the time. You knew what intimacy yeah. looked like. Well, one of the things I would say is that, you know, in terms of the whole rethinking God, right, is everyone has their opinions about what different yeah. verses in the Bible mean. And people, you know, people would argue, does this scripture mean that? Does it mean this? And one of the things I was going to say earlier about the things that Sheila is doing that's different than everyone else is she's not asking 20,000 women, what do you think this scripture means? Or what do you think you need to do to get a happy life? What she did with the study was she said, she asked 20,000 women, 
what is your marriage like? And what is your sex life like? And then she asked, what do you believe about X, Y, or Z? Yeah. And then she compared people who answered differently. Because a lot of people who are critiquing what she says are saying things like, well, you just found people who agreed with your theology, and I still want to make my wife obey me because that's what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. Right, right, and, right. And what she found was, well, you can believe that, but the people who believe that have worse marriages and worse sex lives. Wow. And you're going to need to grapple with that. As, as you rethink God, you need to really grapple with the fact that what you are saying to everyone is God's will, and there's no other interpretation of the Bible, is causing worse sex lives and worse marriages. And Jesus had something to say about that. He said, you shall recognize a tree by its fruit, because a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So people who talk about the only way to interpret the Bible is that the wife is supposed to submit to the husband and obey him, and anybody else who teaches you different doesn't believe the Bible, those people need to grapple with the fact that their tree is bearing a lot of very, very bad fruit. Wow. And Jesus has something to say about that. (laughs) That is so good, Keith. I think that uh, it's something I'm finding I bump up against a lot in our culture, and it's basically the accusation of you don't accept the authority of scripture. And what they really mean is you don't accept my interpretation of scripture. (laughs) And, um, but trying to get people over that hurdle is literally like trying to knock down an idol, like where they've literally kind of made the Bible, the fourth member of the Trinity, specifically the Bible as interpreted the way they interpret it or their leadership has, as opposed to, um, you know, letting Jesus be Jesus and letting the scriptures begin to inform us about his revelation of reality. I, J- Jason and I talk about this all the time, but it's more of the road to Emmaus experience where we're letting Jesus be our rabbi and showing where it points to him in scripture. Um, but I get I get that all the time. And I think that's one of the biggest rubs is somebody telling you that you're outside or, you know, uh, extra scriptural in terms of your, you know, your research. And like you said, Keith, the fruit, I love the way you put it because that's really the bottom line. And, um, and so how do we help people get over that hurdle? I mean, is it just going to be the, the point of pain to where like, listen, your marriage sucks horribly in this area, <laughs> are you willing to rethink it and do something different? I think people are. I, I think that's one reason why our message has resonated so much, because a lot of times this this conversation around what marriage is supposed to look like, what authority looks like, what hierarchy looks like, is focused around scripture and um, and how we see gender. And what we're trying to do is just take it into the bedroom. And pretty much everybody wants an orgasm. Like, like people just want sex to be yeah. great. And so it's interesting how over the years, I have people on all different theological spectrums on my blog because they're just trying to figure out the sex piece. And that's often the way that we can start having these conversations. Because when I can start saying, hey, you know, when you believe that, her chance of having a high libido tanks her chance of orgasm tanks, her rate of sexual pain skyrockets. And people start to listen to that, you know, and now that we've also done this survey for men, um, for the, for the good guys guide to great sex, you know, we found even more evidence of it. Like it doesn't just hurt women. It hurts guys too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and most people do not want to be hurt when it comes, or they certainly don't want their sex life to suffer. Like I said, I, I I read the first third already. And then today I spent uh, a couple hours kind of uh, really familiarizing myself with it. I, I told Derek the first two thirds of it is really practically how to have good sex. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and then you get into, I, I love that you you touch on, uh, I think it's really important that you're touching on some of the broken places in us and pornography. And I, I, you can't write a book to men and not address those things. And um, I think we can touch on that in, in a second, but I, I, I'm, this is what I, I'm fascinated by because I'm a relational guy. I, I even, as a theologian, I refer to myself as a relational theologian. I don't get to um, truths based off of the academic approach. I'm not, I'm not very good at Western enlightenment. I, I get it, but I'm, 
I'm all about, does it work in the context of love? Like how, what does love look like? How does love work? How does intimacy work? How does trust work? I wrote a book called God is not in control. Basically because I was, I, you can't have intimacy where there isn't trust and you can't have trust in a relationship where one side's in control. So I'm, I'm wired that way. And what I, what I love is that you took a, um, an approach to this that wasn't a theological certainty wasn't going to define the answers that you were going to find. You were going to find the answers and the solutions. And, and then, Oh, by the way, the way we're going to measure this is, is do we love more? Do we love God more? Do we love ourselves more? Do we love each other more? And, and I, I love that because that transcends that really connects the biggest issue to be quite frank in those first years of marriage very similar to yours. I, I, when I read your, your testimony, uh, my wife and I had to do a reset about 10 years in and had to go back to the beginning and, and find the young woman who was in pain and felt all of the shame and the, all the stuff that came with it. And the young man who, who was sincere, but felt rejection. And we had to go back to the very beginning and figure out what was going on and, 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 and what love looked like. Or what I was, was going to say is what ruined and what was hurting us was that we had a theological certainty that was in the bedroom that had no place being there. We'd been taught <laughs> some things. We had been, we'd been infused with these certainties about the nature of authority and the nature of marriage. And, and these, these theological things actually were undermining our, our ability to connect and find intimacy. So I, I would love for you to tell a little bit of of how you got there, because I don't think you got there through books. It sounds like you got there. Uh, I'll just share a little bit of your personal journey, uh, because I think so many uh, um, need to have the freedom to actually, I mean, God, good Lord, read your books, for yeah. goodness sake, read your books, because <laughs> yes. they're so helpful. Yes. I wish that they, we had them. But at the same time, I'm always wanting to give people freedom to discover that love, what love truly is, and to be able to to set aside some certainties in the name of love. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to start? And then sure, if you want, that'd be great. I, I have some stuff I would definitely want to say, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I mean, we we were very young. We met in university. We got married in fourth year university, so in our very early twenties. Um, we waited for marriage for sex. We believed all the teachings that then yep. sex is going to be amazing. And we were very much both looking forward to sex until I read The Act of Marriage. <laughs> right, right, right. And in those days before Kindle, um, yeah, I wouldn't do it now, but I used to read in the bathtub and I got about two thirds of the way through and I was so angry at the book that I, I drown it and then I threw it out. <laughs> um, but I was this woman who was really looking forward to this. And in yeah. this Christian book, it was all about everything that I was going to have to do to keep him happy and keep him faithful. Wow. And so sex became this obligation. Yep. And um, I didn't understand it at the time and I couldn't have put words to it really until the last three years when we started doing our survey and I found out, oh, wow, I wasn't the only one. But <laughs> when we when we did get married, I had vaginismus, which is a sexual dysfunction disorder um, where the muscles of the vaginal wall contract and penetration becomes extremely painful, if not impossible. Um Christian women suffer from this at about twice the rate of the general population. And so in our original survey, we wanted to look into this a lot and try to find what is it specifically about being a Christian, which is causing this to be a wow. problem. Cause it's not, you know, believing right. in Jesus does not hurt. <laughs> you sexually. Right. So what is it exactly? <laughs> right. Yeah. And we found that this message of obligation is um, that women's bodies experience that as trauma. Oh because goodness. it's saying wow. you do not have the right um, to your own body. Someone else has the right to use you however they want. Your wow. needs don't matter. And I had internalized that. And I think that's one. It's not the only reason for vaginismus. It's a multifaceted thing. And if any of our listeners are suffering from it, please see a pelvic floor physiotherapist <laughs> because it, it is something which can be fixed. And a lot of women also have pain postpartum even if they never had pain before. And again, pelvic floor physiotherapy can work wonders. Just have to throw that out there. <laughs> um, but sex hurt. And then I was so panicky because I felt like, well, he needs sex to feel loved. Yeah. And so we just, we, we pushed through. It was the wrong thing to do. We got really bad counsel. Right. <laughs> we saw, we saw this gray haired doctor who 
wanted me to strip down in the examining room while he would touch me everywhere and I could speak the words of what my body part wanted and that would magically cure me. And I'm so proud of little 21 year old me for running, kicking and screaming from that room. Yikes. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. but it was, it was bad. So, you know, and similarly me, you know, we, we had in, internalized a lot of messages that were in Christian culture at the time. And again, uh, you know, in line with your thinking, Rethinking God podcast, I, I think that one of the big things is realizing how much we've messed up because we have ascribed to cultural, we've ascribed to what are really cultural ideas, the weight of scriptural authority. Hmm. So there's things in the evangelical yeah. culture, like how yeah. men relate to women, how, how households are supposed to look, which people who are in favor of those ways of doing things say are scripture, right. but they really are a cultural thing. Yeah. Um, and so we we bought a lot of that. And and one of them is like what Sheila's already talked about, is there's this idea through the evangelical church that sex is something that men want, that women need to give to them once you're married. That's good. And so the idea is that if you keep yourself until you're married, then everything will be amazing. And you as a guy <laughs> will finally get the chance to live all your fantasies and everything would be wonderful if you just obey God and keep it together till, till the went rings on her finger. Right. And then we get married and here's this young, you know, I'm not trying to be too hard on myself, but young, stupid guy right. <laughs> who gets married and then my wife can't have sex. Right. And, you know, I, I'm not an, I'm not a bad person. But I had internalized so many ideas about what sex was in marriage that my thought was, oh, great. Now I'm stuck. You know, I've waited and I've waited and now I'm in this relationship and now I can't forever. Right. Basically. Yeah. And when you're that yeah. age, it feels like forever. Doesn't yes. It? <laughs> and also I've been taught, yeah. well, it's her job to make me satisfied and she's not living up to her side of the bargain. Right. And all those kind of not that kind of nonsense. Yeah, yeah, right. And so I, th I think that you're. I think that we'd be much healthier in the church if we got a hold of that idea you were saying earlier about being relational, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it, because it, isn't one of the fundamental truths of the Christian faith that it's not about me, yeah, it's about others, right, right? Right. Yeah. And and if I had had that in my mindset, we would yeah. have got better a lot faster. Yeah. Uh, we did because eventually I. You know, both of us mm -hmm. learned how to kind of ditch the things that we were taught earlier and to actually try to truly connect with each other. Um, and we let go of a lot of these toxic messages that we were still being told by other Christians, mm -hmm. well, you're not biblical then. Right. Um, right. But we didn't have a problem with that because yeah. I believe God is trustworthy. Yeah. I don't think God is a trickster. So if if you see with your own eyes something that seems to contradict what you read in scripture, I think it's okay to question my interpretation of scripture mm -hmm. because I believe God is the truth. So if I see truth in the world, if I see truth in a survey of 20,000 women, if I see truth in the relationships around me yeah. that contradicts the way that I interpret scripture, I actually think I have a moral obligation to question how that's I so, interpret scripture. That's so good. That really that's, is. Because we are fallible humans. Yeah, right? Keith. We're fallible humans. Yeah. Excellent. I have a statement that I say often. It's I love the Word of God and I like my Bible too, <laughs> um, and that that tends to get a little more traction with people in bringing them back to that. Well, Jesus is the truth of what God has to say about Himself, and He can lead you into all truth uh, through Scripture and. Uh, through nature and through other uh, other ways. Thank God for scripture. I've it never minimized the view of scripture in my life. It just brought it into its proper place and context. And I think one of the things I want to just highlight here is that, um, first of all, Sheila, thank you for sharing that story about your doctor. That is like the most cringeworthy thing I've <laughs> ever heard. It was. And the vulnerability that you would share that um, hopefully will cause a lot of other girls to go running in those types of situations, please run. Yeah. Um, that's, that's just amazing. And so the, the thing I want to highlight is I think the work that you guys have done, the experience that you've walked through together, although in some ways, Keith, as a young guy, you might think, Oh man, 
there's a lot of regret because I could have had this so much sooner. I could have had this intimacy, this closeness. We could have had this better. Um, because of walking through that, you're bringing this message and this comfort to like hundreds of thousands of people. And I believe it'll be even, even more. There's a scripture in Corinthians where Paul says, the comfort that you have received from God is so that you can comfort one another's one another. This area of like rethinking the evangelical, you know, um, stronghold on sex uh, and, and rethinking it and breaking it. It's, it's a, it's a comfort that you guys own. And through the reading of your books, which I definitely want to get into now, um, this is going to, this is going to bring comfort to a lot of people and it's going to, you know, turn the lights on to say, wow, okay, it's, it's okay to question the certainty that I was fed from leadership or from sources that I trusted. Um, I think, I honestly think at this point in my life that, that there is a sin of certainty Mm -hmm. and we need to start asking better questions. We need to allow people to ask questions and be able to say, Hey, I don't know, but let's explore that together. Um, that seems to be the rethinking framework that you guys are, are taking this whole thing from. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Guys, the book is out leaving and finding Jesus. I'm so excited about it. In this book, we trade a punishing God for reconciling love. We exchange the lens of retribution for the transforming revelation of God in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Wherever you are on the journey, I really believe this book will encourage you. So it's available now on Amazon or at our website, familystory.org. Buy it. Buy multiple copies. Share it. And then do me a favor. If it's blessed you, write a review on Amazon. Guys, I'm so thankful for you. So thankful to be on this journey with you, praying life and joy and wonder over you today. All right, let's get back to the podcast. Last time we had you on, Sheila, this book wasn't done, or if it was, it was, I think you were finishing it. You guys were, were finishing it and it was coming out yeah. and we talked about it a little bit. Um, and it would, it completely made, I was so excited you were writing it because I, f- I felt like I, I think again, relationally, I have two daughters and I got a son. And so I'm constantly thinking on behalf of my, my daughters and, and how important this book is for her and where she can put boundaries and expectations and there's the, how she will approach, uh, she's about to get married, you know, um, she's going to love that I'm talking about this, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, this, the, these books are going to be gifts for my, my new son-in-law, my new son, you know, and, uh, and then I have a son, I, I have a son and, and I, and I think the, the broken understanding of obligation and transactional sex is just as damaging for him in, in ways that um, we, we maybe haven't, begun to measure. Uh, and, and I think rightfully so we needed to, to, to write the ship with w- what was happening to women, but how, how damaging it is, uh, to young men as well. And, and I think a lot of that, um, you'll see in pornography and you'll see in how that's impacted our culture. Uh, and, and, and yet I, so I would love for you to speak to that, uh, either one of you and maybe dive into that part. And- I know you get passionate about this. Can I start and then yeah, I'll let you okay. get passionate. Good. Okay. <laughs> I think the church has such a low view of men and I think it makes men stuck and it really makes me upset. And we do that in several ways. The first is we present men as completely incapable of self-control. Right. Right. So we tell girls, boys will push your sexual boundaries. So you need to be the gatekeeper. Um, boys are going to lust. So you need to watch what you wear or you become a stumbling block. And so boys have no self-control, which is simply not true. Self-control is a fruit right. of the spirit <laughs> for pity sake. That's right. <laughs> and, um, so that's one. The next one is we present men as incapable of intimacy. Yeah. We, we talk about how women are the ones who need to talk and who need emotional connection. What men need is physical release, like love and respect, literally call sex physical release. That's all it is. So does power of a praying wife. So does every man's battle. Wow. Like they describe sex as about men's release. Wow. And, and then they say, you know, but men don't need all the talking stuff. 
It's like, no, men are relational. Yeah. Men are intimate. Yeah. Men have emotions. We have God given emotions. And what we have done is we've told men you're not allowed to show any emotions because if you show any emotions, you're not a real man. And so what are, what do men do? They take all their negative emotions and they channel them into pornography or sex. Right, right. And then they live very stunted lives. And it's not fair yeah. because we have done that yeah. largely to men. And I'll let you, I'll let you talk. I'm going to shut up in just a sec. And then, the, and then the final one, I think, is we have convinced several generations of boys now that they are incapable of living a pure life because we have told them that if they notice a woman is beautiful, they've already lost it. Right, right. Wow. That was a big one yeah. for me as a young man, yeah. And so poor little 13-year-old boys don't know what right. to do because everywhere they look, they notice boobs. <laughs> and so they think, oh my goodness, That's I right. am a terrible sinner. Yeah. As opposed to just being told, you know, noticing isn't lusting. Yeah. You know, lust is a deliberate, deliberate choice that you're making. And so don't worry about noticing. Right. And we have, we've, we've just, we've made so many boys think that they are such terrible sinners that there's no point in even trying. That's so good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just to pick up on what Sheila is saying, I would, I would agree that our view of men is really quite low in the church. Um, we have a, uh, like the whole idea of lust. We, we use the term every man's battle. Like lust is every man's battle. Um, Sheila's written some blog mm. posts where she talks about how, like, you know, this is this should not be every man's every man's battle. Um, you know, the Bible says we should put lust to death. Wow, this shouldn't be something that we struggle with our entire lives. You know, it should be something we can put to death. And she said pastors say that she's unbiblical wow. and anti man because this is just the way God made men. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and and this is this is what we hear all the time. Uh, there's there's a there's a really terrible section, and I won't go through all the details, but there's a really terrible section. In one of the books called "Every Heart Restored," which is in the Every Man's Battle series, and I won't go through all the details. But basically, a woman decides to not say no to her husband ever, and he basically, again, not to be too crude, but he basically ends up using her as a sex doll because he's just going crazy with whatever he wants, and she felt totally used by him. And she confronted him with it. Um, and the authors of the book basically say, you know, yes, that's right. It was, it was wrong for him to do that. But you need to realize that you basically promised him every man's dream. Mm. And, and so my first thought was, you know, like, if it really is every man's dream to just have one-sided using my wife for whatever I want, whenever I want it, is that really what we believe God created men to be? Is is that really, can we not rise above that as Christian men? <laughs> yeah. Is that really where we're at? Mm. But the authors get even, it goes downhill from there because they basically start by saying, God created your sexuality for each other. So, you know, you as a woman are supposed to give him what he needs sexually. And then they realize that there's kind of a lopsidedness to this. Yeah. And they say basically something along the lines of, and his sexuality is supposed to be for you. But unfortunately, men just don't have that Christian view of sex. Man. That's literally in the book. Man. And this is what our teachings are. They're saying there's an ideal of how sex should be, but men just aren't like that. So Man. women need to adjust. And again, it comes back to this idea of women are there for men. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> women are there to obey men and do what men need, yeah. as opposed to saying, you know, if, if we're seeing this kind of fruit and we're seeing destruction, maybe we need to go back and look at the Bible again. And maybe God actually created us to work together wow. in harmony, wow. in unity, in relationship. Yeah. Wow. Not that I'm into plugging my books, but I wrote a book called Prone to Love. Yeah, yeah. And, and the idea is that there's a the, the famous hymn, Come Thou Fount. There's a line in there called Prone to Wander, Lord, I Feel It. Mm. And, and my grandmother lived to be 100, around 80. She had the epiphany. One day while in, in church, they were singing and she got stubborn and stopped singing. And my cousin asked her what was wrong. And she said, I'm not prone to wander, Jonathan. I love him. Mm. And it was this huge shift. What you're talking about is when you start 
when men are prone to wander, men are prone, like my passion for my son is what you've talked about. I mean, for a long time, he only knew about one fruit of the spirit because all I preached was self-control, right? (laughs) 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 But, but the, but the point is, is that I, I, as a parent, my job was to release identity over them. How does the father see you? And he sees you prone to love. You're actually prone and made in the image and likeness of God, prone to love. And I think what you're talking about is the this, again, I know we're, we're doing that theology thing, but this rethinking God here. But again, the thoughts we have about God then impact how we think about ourselves. And if God created us prone to wander, if, he, if God created a man prone to lust, then then the solution is a woman needs to be uh, available to him 24 seven. And oh my goodness, now we've, we've moved into transaction. We've moved outside of intimacy. We've moved outside of relationship. I so love what you're talking about. And I think it's so true and so needed. You, you, you uh, actually write about it in the chapter. You don't, uh, you don't need uh, that fix. Is that the title? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think That's so. the chapter. You don't need that fix. And you, uh, a couple of things, myths and facts in there. One, one myth that I was, uh, was new to me that you exposed is that not, it's not 80% of all men uh, are addicted to pornography. And I grew up, uh, that's all I've heard. And it's much smaller. And uh, that, that's really was encouraging to read. And one of the takeaways from this was that we don't we don't help men get set free by counting sin, and I'm 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 using my language now. But that was your point. We're not. This isn't a behavior thing. This is a heart thing. And I'd love for you to speak to um, the freedoms you're seeing people come into uh, around around that that truth right there. That understanding. Yeah. Can I start with this one? Sure. Yeah. So specifically with the pornography thing, I think the thing is that we look at pornography wrong because we don't really understand that pornography and sex aren't the same thing. So sex in a Christian context is the things that Sheila said. It's meant to be mutual, um, intimate, yeah. and, and pleasurable for both. That's that's what God's intention was. What pornography is, is pornography is a unilateral, one-sided, getting what I want out of something. It's using another person for my own gratification. Yeah. And that is the exact opposite of what sexuality was meant to be it's meant it's by nature meant to be mutual not unilateral yeah what i think we've done in the church and why i think so many men have a struggle with porn is because in the world you know quote unquote you know we're taught you know just get what you want out of life you know take care of yourself don't hurt anybody else but take care of yourself that's right. all fine right and that gets translated into sexuality as well yeah and in the church, we haven't responded with, that's not the point. The point is mutuality. We've responded with, that's absolutely true, but just don't do it until you're married. Wow. <laughs> wow. And yeah. that's, yeah. And yeah. that's why our resources for men are like white knuckle it. Don't use porn. We know you all want to use porn. Right. 97% of men are using porn at this exact minute. <laughs> right. um, it's You're never going to be free of not wanting to watch porn, but just don't because God will make you burn in hell forever if you do. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> As opposed to saying pornography is a cheap imitation of the true beautiful thing that God created, which is human sexuality. Yeah. Mm. Human sexuality is is meant to be expressed in a mutual, loving, intimate relationship Hmm. and you are trading that for pictures of a woman who has been trafficked yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. if we put it in those terms i think the fight against pornography would be a lot easier yeah than the way that we talk about it in the church which is just it's a sin don't do it yeah yeah it's it's just right now i'm realizing when you title something every man's you are taking this like position that i i am now speaking for every man and i think mm-hmm. we kind of rose up and said yeah no you're not maybe you're just projecting your own <laughs> problems on the rest of the world um but somehow because you're first to press or first to to be in print you become the standard and uh i know i know that that is something that ultimately has to come down um you do not mm-hmm. speak for me uh, I, I am one of the every man and I, I'm not experiencing what you're talking about in this context. Um, mm-hmm. I just, I love, here's what I love. I love how truth sets people free. 
Yes. And so yeah. what you're doing is you're you're identifying a lot of the lies that we've been fed and and you know, bringing truth to it. And because of that, there's freedom in it. But you know, a lot of that material is out there. A lot of that content has been accepted almost as like scriptural in in nature like this is exactly what it means and what god has to say about it um and that that's i think what's caused a lot of the you know exodus from the church in the first place people are just done with it um and what i see you guys almost doing is you're you're deconstructing sex (laughs) and bringing it into alignment with its its original purpose. I mean, that's what it, that's what it feels like to me. And, uh, I don't know if that's a fair assessment, but for, you know, with deconstruction, a lot of it is just, it's so disorienting for people, but then when they, they begin to ask better questions and they look at reality, um, man, it begins to really draw them to resources like yours that can be helpful and not harmful. I honestly think that a big part of the season that we're in right now as, as a church, as a whole is the literal um, burning down of the old building and finding that it's okay. We, we, we built some bad stuff, some bad theology, some, some bad content, but guess what? When the ashes are cold and blown away, we're going to find that we're all standing on this rock called Jesus, and we can rebuild from there. To me, that's the best example of what I, I see people like you guys doing is, hey, let's just let's just go ahead and burn, burn the old thing down, <laughs> but let's do it with uh, something to reconstruct and something to reorient ourselves towards, you know, what God is like. So yeah, I tossed, I tossed every man's series out a long time ago because I just didn't see it getting anybody anywhere and it helped no one, but I didn't have the, the language and the verbiage that you guys have and that you're bringing. And so, so now I want, I'm giving, you know, every premarital counseling that we do, we're, we're giving them uh, the good girl's guide to sex, the good guy's guide to sex in saying, Hey, let, let this help shape your life together. And uh, it's a much better foundation to stand on. Yeah, our prayer is that if enough couples are given the good girl's guide to great sex and the good guy's guide to great sex now, then in 10 years, nobody's going to need the great sex rescue. That's that's my goal. Wow, <laughs> Let's wow. get rid of the need for the great sex rescue by just stopping all the toxic teaching and getting wow. back to what is healthy. And I think it's possible. Amen. I really do, because Amen. I think a lot of the toxic stuff was from generations, like it, it was largely, to be honest, boomers it was and and millennials and gen and gen sorry the canadians about to come out in me but millennials and gen z like <laughs> there it is you know, Zed. You know, they're just not <laughs> buying it and they want something that's real they want yeah, true right. intimacy yeah um mm-hmm. and not just in the marriage relationship in their friendships yeah. and in their churches as well yeah mm-hmm. and uh and, and when men have been told to take all of their emotions and channel them into sex because you're not allowed to have real deep friendships. That's not masculine, you know, Um, then it's, or or show your emotions to your wife or show your emotions to your wife, except through sex. Yeah. Yeah. Guys know that's shallow (laughs) and they don't want it. That's not actually what we we want. Mm -hmm. Uh, Male and husbands and wife. We want intimacy. We want connection. We want to be seen and to see. I mean, that's, that's the reality. If you can actually strip everything away, that's what we we're hungry for. Right. And we want freedom. Uh, I, I, I want to note it because in the book you, you actually do, you know, there's, there's freedom and restoration. If you have been navigating through brokenness or through pornography or through that, that God is a, a reconciling God and a restorer. And, and so just, if you're listening, um, if, if you, it's not like, um, if you've already gone down that road, you guys actually address that. No, God is, mm-hmm. God is, God is a good God. And he's in the reconciling business and the restoration business. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's in setting, uh, setting us free business. I, I, I heard uh, we had someone on the podcast a couple of years back and he talked about uh, freedom in, in this way. And I, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, but he said, you know, true freedom. Uh, I used to say freedom was the self-control. 
And I think there's some truth to that, but, but true freedom is, is the, that you no longer have the desire to do what's wrong in the first place. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I believe that that's, uh, that's what we're hungry for, that this generation is actually hungry for that kind of freedom and that kind of intimacy. Um, I wish I had this book. Oh, my wife, like I said, I went downstairs and I was reading her stats and we were laughing and, you know, going back and forth. And she's really happy that she's not on this conversation because uh, <laughs> uh, you guys are way more, uh, uh, you can talk about these things a whole lot. Uh, more comfortable talking about this than, than than she or I would be, but but um, could you speak to um, what you're seeing? Maybe tell us some breakthrough stories, some some of your favorite stories of where you're seeing uh, marriages transformed. Uh, I imagine you've got some some pretty cool mm-hmm. ones. I think, um, yeah. I, oh gosh, I can think of so many, but I'll tell you what people what people have consistently told me is the best part of the Good Guys Guide to Great Sex that helped them so much was just the talk about the sexual response cycle, mm-hmm. because people don't talk about this, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's in the front end of the book. Yeah, and I don't know how how explicit you mind me getting because I often say stuff that I don't think is weird, but most people do. But <laughs> this is a podcast, Sheila. We are free to do whatever the heck okay. we want. Bring Here's- it. Here's what we need to understand. We have a 47 point orgasm gap in the church, by which we mean that 95% of men almost always or always reach orgasm in a given sexual encounter, but only 48% of women do. So we got a 47 point gap. We don't want a 47 point gap. I don't think anybody (laughs) wants a 47 point gap. We want to bridge that gap. So we want women to become more orgasmic. So how do we get there? Well, you can argue that he just needs to learn foreplay. He just needs to learn what to do. And there's a whole bunch of books that have actually been written, even in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that tell him exactly what to do. You know, you rub here 238 times. You know, you do this for eight minutes. Like, it's very explicit. Right. And it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because it's not that he needs to know what to do. It's that he needs to know when to do it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. It's that he needs to understand how her body works. And that means understanding the sexual response cycle, because all of us go through different um, stages as we're going towards orgasm. It's excitement, which is when you're just starting, your heart rate starting to get a little bit faster. You're starting to get a little warmed up. Then you get to arousal, which is when for her, she's starting to get lubricated Um, you know, the genitals start wanting to be touched and then you get to plateau when you're almost at orgasm and then you get to orgasm. The thing is for men, all of those stages look virtually the same. (laughs) Okay. Right. Right. (laughs) Like he's ready to go at the beginning, but for women, they're very different. And if you go right for the genitals before she's excited, it feels like a pap smear for her. It's not a comfortable thing. So the big thing that couples need to learn is how to focus on her body and how to help her listen to her body and how to help him listen to her body and just slow the whole thing down, back the truck up, slow the whole thing down. Um, You know, and the, uh, there's another aspect to the sexual response cycle, which is desire or the, the, the urge to actually have sex and like, yes, I want to get it on. And for some people, desire precedes excitement. So before the whole thing even starts, you're like, you look at your wife and you're like, yeah, let's do it. But for some people, desire doesn't even kick in until after excitement. Right. So it's not until you've started to kiss and touch and stuff that, that someone's like, oh, you know what? I think I would really like to have sex. Like, this is really working for me. And we can call that the difference between a responsive libido and a spontaneous libido. And we get the idea that all men are spontaneous and all women are responsive, but it's not. (laughs) You know, more men are spontaneous than responsive and more women are responsive than spontaneous, but there's a lot of crossover. Right. Hmm. And so it's really best if we forget everything (laughs) about, you know, men are like this and women are like this and just focus on what you each are like yeah, and what your body reacts to yeah. and how can we help, you know, both of us get towards orgasm, which really means helping her get there because he's going to get there automatically. Right, right, right. We got 47% gap, you said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we spent a lot of time in the book just, just going over how to listen to her body, yeah. you know, and how to work with her body. Um, because that's what we really, that's what we really need to do. And that's what often people are missing and don't understand. So good. good. 
That's yeah. good. The thing I would add to that too is, you know, Sheila talked about excitement preceding arousal. So, you know, one of the things we say in the book is, you know, excitement is that is the things that typically guys don't consider sexual. You know, like rubbing the inside of her arms or nibbling on her ear or or things like that that are just exciting, give you goosebumps, but they're not. We don't think of them as quotes sexual, right? Um, and uh, and the thing is that sometimes women need to have a little bit of that before they even perk up and go. Well, actually, yeah, maybe I am interested, right? So the the thing we talk about in the book too for guys specifically is, you know, don't do those things because the expectation is going to be this is where mm. we're going. Because if she picks that up, then every time you put your arm around her or give her a kiss in the neck or whatever, it's going to feel like, I, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to start because yeah, I don't want to go where this is going to go. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So we talk a lot about valuing non-sexual touch as part of just relationship as well too. But then also specifically in the sexual encounter, realizing that you do need a lot of that stuff early on to get her in the mood and in, the, in that mm-hmm. sort of mindset for that. And it's not abnormal if your wife doesn't want to have sex with you all the time because a lot of guys feel rejected because sure. uh, I see her, she, you know, I happen to walk in while she's getting out of the shower and I'm like, Oh, and, and she doesn't do that for me. Right, right, <laughs> and right. it's like, I feel rejected, you know, as a man, it's like, right. well, no, that doesn't mean that she doesn't want you. It just means that maybe she's more responsive that once you start doing things together, then she's like, Oh, I like this. I, 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 I want to do this. That's so good. Um, and that's just the way that, that she is. And it's okay. And don't, don't, um, think that it means she doesn't want you, that she doesn't love you, she doesn't find you attractive, you know? That's so helpful. And uh, what I really love, and, you know, we had to learn this uh, on our own, I think, like you guys, and, um, but everyone's mm-hmm. different. Mm. E- everyone's different. And, you know, you're reading the book and there's three positions or four positions or whatever it is in, in light of how we're talking. You know, my, my wife would prefer I talked about homeschool and and your approach to homeschooling because that's that's her approach she's a homeschool mom so she's like you can do it any way your kid learns we all learn different but the the freedom that you guys give in these books to be able to uh the safe place to be able to just discover your differences and and uh, the liberties that you can you can have with each other man i'm really grateful for this book Mm -hmm. and like i said uh, i'm giving it to my uh my daughter and my my son-in-law so uh, they'll, they'll, they'll love that I'm announcing it over the podcast. But, <laughs> hey, I, I think you might at some point include a bonus chapter on non-sexual uh, chores because vacuuming the carpets and cleaning the hardwoods is a really uh, escalating thing for, for my wife. She sees me in that activity and she's like, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's, and I think, that's, that, I think what you guys chapter. are saying- that You actually, that, actually have that in there that, along- I, I, I have a chapter on that. It's called uh, "Sex Starts in the Kitchen, but Not Why You Think." Yeah, not the way, you, <laughs> not the way you think. Oh, okay, love it. Um, I think that the emphasis on learning each other in the context of a marriage and letting that be a lifelong journey, but once again, starting off on the right foot, starting off on the right path. Um, I think that's what I'm talking about with with you guys and with this this book, these books. And I've left out the word great. I apologize for that. It's not the good girls. Oh, it's okay. great sex. Great <laughs> sex. Fine. No, I, I honestly think that getting the mindset that if we can get this into our Gen Zs. Gen Z. Right now, <laughs> that in 10 to 12 years, the church could look completely different. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and just dismantle those old mindsets and those, the old teaching. Cause this yeah. generation is honestly asking the best questions. Yeah, they are. They they're are. asking great questions and they're getting, you know, they're getting walked out of their churches as a result of it. And yeah. um, you know, yeah. we want to be a place to welcome those questions and to have a place of growing together and uncertainty. And so um Yeah. I think that's uh, I think that's what you guys are a part of, mm-hmm. and it it's no less church than a Sunday morning service. Yeah. yeah, that's that's definitely how we see it too. And honestly, it's just it's so interesting to me to see all the letters that I get saying, "You brought me back to Jesus because you showed me what what intimacy looks like." Because Love it. you look at all the toxic messages 
that are wow. so objectifying of women and so demeaning of men. Yeah. And that's a terrible view of who God yeah. is. And so, yes, we might be talking about sex, yeah. but we're really talking yeah. about God. Mm-hmm. Yes, you are. Yeah. Love it. Absolutely. That's so good. I, I mean, that, we need to put a plug in for your book, Jason. Jason's got a new book out called Leaving and Finding Jesus. We're getting them all in on today. <laughs> Well, but I mean, it's so good. It's so good. It's based on the fact that we do need to leave the Jesus that is, has been misportrayed Mm -hmm. to us and find the real one. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, there's a lot of uh, trepidity with that process, Mm -hmm. but ultimately it results and yields in this fruit of really, truly knowing the real Jesus. And um, yeah you guys bringing it out in the context of sex is, is amazing. I love so it. Awesome. Yeah. We're so grateful uh, for you guys. Really uh, thankful uh, that you took some time with us too. a few things we got to hit before we let you go. And unless there's anything else you're okay. like, you gotta, but we got to talk tacos. Yes. Um, okay. okay. Because uh, it's rethinking God with tacos. Um, mostly because I didn't want to, I didn't want to get too serious. We didn't want to take ourselves too serious, but also because of the nature of the, of fellowshipping around food. And I like tacos. Here's what I learned. I've learned if you write something in a book, like I really like strawberry rhubarb pie, then when you're traveling and they take you out, somebody makes you strawberry rhubarb pie. So that was right. part of the thought. I thought, man, rethink it got with tacos and it works. I was in California just a couple of weeks ago and they took me to the best tacos, man. So <laughs> taco stories. Tell me, tell me what's your favorite taco is. You know, I have a couple. I, I'll, I'll do a different one than I shared last time. Um, we spent a lot of time in our RV. Uh, yeah. Where we used to before COVID, anyway, we used to speak a lot in the southern states, um, and we would go down in the winter. And it is so fun to go to Mexican restaurants. It's like a mm-hmm. whole new world yeah. that we don't have up here. <laughs> it's not Taco Bell. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so good. And we yeah. that's that's like our go-to thing now is to find an authentic Mexican restaurant nice. whenever we're in the South. It's amazing. Oh yeah. man, yeah. We got them too. We got some good places. Oh yeah. <laughs> so so my question for you is, you know, am I beyond the pale if I say to you, I think I'm more of a burrito guy? Like oh, no, no, is no, that no. all right? No, no. You know, burrito's just a just a soft taco. <laughs> yeah, we do not discriminate against any form of taco. We do not discriminate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're very inclusive. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you the reason I like the burrito is just you can cram so much more in there. It doesn't break apart. Oh, he's a volume guy. Yeah. So that's that's kind of okay. okay. what brought me over to burrito. <laughs> I'm on team burrito all the way. I, I, hey, man, I'm all over that. Hey, um, Sheila and Keith, just you know, to ask you, you said you do travel a bit. Uh, have you ever been to Charlotte? Yes. Yeah, I we have. So, yeah. 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 Love to come back sometime. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, we'd love to host you at River Church and uh, maybe pull off some type of, you know, seminar weekend type thing. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, so okay. your, yeah. your voice can get amplified. So we can talk about that later. Yeah. But uh, seriously, thank you guys so much. It really is a joy to speak with you and um, yeah. to point people towards your resources. Uh, as a pastor, I got to tell you, you know, I started throwing resources out a long time ago mm-hmm. and just was in this void. I was in the wilderness of resources until the great sex rescue came out. And then now these other two guides are just going to be phenomenal. And I'm recommending them to every pastor yeah. that I know. Can you share um, how you're found uh, website, uh, socials, any of that stuff before we let you go? Sure. So baremarriage.com is my website. Uh, Bear Marriage is my podcast. And if you go to baremarriage.com, you'll find links to my Instagram, my Facebook, uh, my Twitter. I get really fierce on Twitter. I'm a different person on each social media thing. <laughs> yes. So if you want to see fierce Sheila, go to Twitter. If yeah. you want to see like, like, hip Sheila go to Instagram, <laughs> you know? Um, and then, yeah, the podcast keeps on the podcast a lot with us yeah, and, my- and links to all the books are there too. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Hey, I got to put a little plug in. I think, I think Sheila and I have the same spirit animal on Twitter. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. kind of like, it's kind of like Paul. He was like, yeah, when I show up, I'm kind of nice, but when I write letters, I can <laughs> bring it. <laughs> so I've enjoyed watching Sheila. Okay. I got to tell you this though, Sheila, the thing I love about you 
is you answer stuff with truth and you don't back down. You've got a steel spine, but you're never mocking. You're kind. Uh, you maintain a disposition of of uh, truth in the midst of confronting, you know, some of these, and I've, I've seen some of your interactions. Um, and I got to tell you, the other side was just a freaking jerk. I, I honestly think that like, wow. Okay. I've just lost all respect for you, but Sheila, you still maintain respect in your Twitter spirit animal form, which I, I love. I'm definitely built the same way. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's good because I, I I do worry about that a lot. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I the is it I fixed it or those the yeah I, I fixed, fixed it, it for, for you is, yes yeah. I fixed it for you yes I've read several of those to my wife we've enjoyed those so <laughs> hey so so good connecting with you guys uh, thankful to have you on and um, again we'll we'll let folks know about the, you on the front end as well but we really appreciate you bye guys all right well thank you so much it's Thanks great talking to you again. Us. Hey guys, we're so glad that you are joining us. You can find me, Derek Turner, at rivercharlotte.com. That's my church. And I'm on all the social medias yes. as Pastor Derek T. D-E-R-E-K, Pastor Derek T. I'm also on Twitter uh, at Jason Clark Is, uh, And you can find all of these podcasts, including season one, on all of the platforms. Apple, uh, Spotify, Spotify. Uh, all the places all the places you can also go to a familystory.org and everything's there if you sign up for our mailing list we send out a weekly email that has uh, articles podcast information and uh, we also let you know about new books coming out or events that we're uh, connected to so yeah uh, like share retweet and uh, and man if you could write a review it actually does something for the rankings it, it, it does it more yeah available, so but a five-star review of course <laughs> yes you know if you can't write a five-star review or something <laughs> Like just don't even write don't, a review. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like if you can't say something nice, don't say anything, don't say at, anything all. at all. I, I like that, and then apply that to this <laughs> podcast. Definitely, that's my motto. That's I like. What I do. I love it. So, love you guys. Appreciate you coming on the ride with us. God bless. <laughs>